Kicking off the list at number 10, Superman's Secret. Ooh. So in Superman issue 300 back in 1939, we see the front cover of this issue and it shows in big text, revealed at last, the startling secret of how Superman fools the world with his Clark Kent identity. And you see Superman on the cover like, Lana, look at my face. Do you believe me? He's on point, like he's very aggressive. He's like, I'm Clark Kent, look at my face. It's basically what we've all been thinking when we see this guy in his disguise. The whole issue is about how dumb the glasses disguise is. And it's pretty funny at first, but the thing that sucked was that he explained how his glasses are made from Kryptonian plexiglass and how that intensifies the low level hypnotic effect. So people see him as Clark Kent rather than Superman. So he can be dressed in his gear and people are like, no, you're, you're definitely Clark Kent. I'm looking right at you. Your chest is the size of a car, but you know what? I think you're still Clark Kent. It wasn't until Burton's 1986 reboot until his power was dropped, thankfully. Because if they had kept that idea, then it would have made the, the comics where Bruce Wayne pretends to be Superman pretty unnecessary. Also, if Superman has these powers in comics or movies, that would just be hilarious. It would just be Henry Cavill at the bar in his Superman gear just flexing. Then a guy pours a beer on his head while we're just staring at him in costume. That would have just been weird. That guy should have been punched out to space also. Forget about his truck being stuck in trees. He should have grabbed him and just went, gone. Number nine, Catwoman's origin. Okay, this one's super funny to me. So Frank Miller released Batman year one and it was this dark and gritty issue and included with it had Selena Kyle's true origins. She lived life on the streets and resorted to work just to make ends meet. People loved this dark origin story. This was a superhero origin story. Then the new 52 released Catwoman Zero in 2011 and the origin went from dark and DC like to just, well, this. She is seen as this amateur thief and she has an epiphany while falling out of a window and she smacks the ground quite hard. And then out of nowhere, a group of stray cats appear and start to lick her back to life. Look at her face getting all sticky. First of all, the sound. Second of all, the smell. Wouldn't be the best. Basically just doing what Tim Burton did, but on the page. No, no way. Number eight, One Punch Man. Superboy Prime punches through reality itself. It is one of the most talked about events in DC's comic book history, and it has fans split over the overall decision. Crisis on Infinite Earths happened and brought together all these Golden Age and Silver Age heroes into the same place. It was a move made to retcon certain plot points while setting up a brighter and certainly bolder future. So what happens when you lock Superboy Prime up in a pocket universe? Well, once he's out, he gets so mad that he punches, but he doesn't just punch a hole in the wall like your classic Kyle from high school. No, 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 he punches through reality, creating the multiverse, bringing back the dead Robin from the 80s, Jason Todd, to life. And that wasn't the only change though when it comes to the multiverse collapsing. Like Elastigirl's resurrection and then the other characters come back as if they had truly never died. Like we had Lynx, Reactron, Ventriloquist, Scarface, and Magpie. This punch also changed some major history with Joe Chill, which I'll get into later. The numerous versions of General Zod were also replaced by just the one version. So, what a mess. Just, just what a mess. Number seven, after the new 52 retcon, we saw Barbara Gordon in an entirely new way. So Alan Moore released The Killing Joke, and in this comic, we see a paralyzed Barbara Gordon from the waist down. She then became Oracle and did a pretty bang up job with the Bat family. Also, she's in a wheelchair. How often do you see that? More inclusion for the win, folks. Let's get it. But with the new 52 retcon, we have Barbara Gordon back as Batgirl. So while some fans are happy with the change, most have expressed quite a bit of rage online, rightfully so. Number six, Identity Crisis. Brad Meltzer's Identity Crisis was a seven part issue released back in 2004. The first issue actually did really well with pre-orders, passing I think like 160,000. But come issue two, fans weren't nearly as interested the first time around. There was a huge decline in numbers. Why though? Well, the cruelty of the content was deemed a bit too much for comic book readers at the time. It had basically turned into a murder mystery about the death of Sue Dibney. Fans weren't on board with how dark the story got with certain details. Some drawing the conclusion that it was done just for shock value. Fans have said that every character involved in that comic was just ruined. So what do you guys think? Agree, disagree? Comment down below. Number five, evil Amazons. Yeah, you heard that correctly. The new 52 comes through yet again. 
to disappoint fans. The new 52 Wonder Woman series began in June 2016 and Brian Azzarello made the Amazon's origin so that they attacked sailors on the high seas that were too close to their land. Okay, and if that wasn't bad enough, Azzarello even went so far as to make the Amazons murder these sailors and then toss their bodies in the water. And if they have any sons, well, those sons are being sold right into slavery. I don't think we'll be seeing this in the Wonder Woman sequel. Uh, I mean, maybe? Imagine if they went from like the first movie to like a band of hardcore pirates just whipping people off boats. Get out of town. The Wonder Woman clay origin was preferred over the new stuff. These false memories that were written to her story were liked. I mean, rightfully so. Number four, what is love? More like, where is love? Green Arrow and Black Canary are an iconic couple, or rather, were. The two have been together since their early issues in the 60s, and then the reboot came along in 2011, and they weren't lovers anymore. <laughs> What? For five years, readers had to watch them not be in love, and it was a weird time. Eventually, DC listened, and then when DC Rebirth happened, the couple was back together again. Now, this made fans happy, of course, but that was five years of storytelling, and now those issues are just scrapped. Awesome, sick, five years. A lot of words, a lot of eye movements, thanks. Number three, dead or alive. Superboy issue 158 came out in 1949, so it was a little while back now. And the cover of the issue is enough to pull any reader in. It shows Superboy in space looking down at a capsule with his parents in it. And the words, they're alive, my real mother and father. And behold, a couple of sleeping beauties. Jor-El and Lara were drifting in space for 15 years. The radio transmission comes in, calling Kal-El, calling Kal-El, and then he's like, yo, that's my name, let's do it, let's go. And it's a nice moment or two. Superboy reflects on recognizing his parents' voices, even though he was just a wee baby when he last saw them. So how sweet. But in the new 52 Rebirth storylines, apparently Jor-El survived the Krypton explosion, thanks to Dr. Manhattan. And he then became Mr. Oz, who was like a villain. This new 52 retcon makes absolute no sense. We saw Krypton's death, and we also saw his parents dying in it with our eyes. Number two, Jack and Joe. We all know the name Joe Chill, the guy who killed Bruce Wayne's parents, Martha and Thomas Wayne. Now after watching the 1989 Tim Burton Batman film, there's now another name in our minds when we think of the person that killed his parents. We of course think back to the Joker and having him as the one who killed his parents in the movie. So which is the right one? Which one's true? So fans had to wonder this for years. If Joe Chill was actually the killer, these are confusing times. And then in Infinite Crisis issue six, we see that Cho is again the killer of the Wayne's family. Thankfully, I mean, part of Batman's story was based off this way of things. And after Infinite Crisis, they made it so Cho was arrested the same night he killed Bruce Wayne's parents. These stories are way too confusing at times. Even reading this, my brain hurts. And finally, number one, no kill. We all know Batman by his one rule, and breaking that rule is Joker's goal in the Dark Knight film, to never kill. Of course, having his parents die at the hands of a killer, one would assume he's not too fond of the act. But let's go back. Let's go back to Batman's first appearance. Back in 1939, Detective Comics issue 27, we straight up see Bruce push a guy into acid. Acid! It's said in the early days that many, many criminals died by the hands of the bat. Bill Finger came in and retconned it, so the Kid Crusader, starting in Batman issue 6, tells Robin that we never kill with weapons of any kind. With weapons? Ooh, gotta read the fine print, I don't know. No, no, Batman at that point still goes by the no kill rule. But what do you guys think? Was his actions like in Batman vs Superman unwarranted? I mean, this is obviously a darker, older version of the Batman where clearly people close to him have died. I personally think he should kill. Make it so he pops dudes. People love the Punisher. I mean, you know, he wrecks people. Go get him, Batsy. All right, at number 10, we have the very silly, but nonetheless evil, Super Enemies. In the 1970s animated TV show, Super Friends, there's an episode in 1979 called Universe of Evil, where Superman travels to an alternate universe to meet the evil counterparts to the Super Friends, very creatively named the Super Enemies. And the team is made up of all those bad guys we've all known so well and grown up with. You know, like Aquaman with an eye patch and Tinted Red Batman, and oh, who could forget the iconic alien monkey Gleek, 
what a trailblazing team of supervillains they were. But as much as I roast them, they do actually pose a decent threat to Superman in this storyline, to the point where they team up with the military armed with kryptonite weapons, and even bring in their own version of Superman, giving our Superman a good old run for his money. But luckily, Superman Prime finds something called an antimatter flask, which turns all the super enemies back to being good again. Thank God Aquaman retires that eye patch and is no longer so intensely menacing looking. What a relief. Number 9. Justice League of Assassins Unfortunately, this evil Justice League didn't stick around too long. Being first introduced in Superman Vol. 4, Number 15, in March 2017, the Justice League of Assassins on Earth-14 were a group of augmented, mostly non-superpowered soldiers led by the obviously powerful Superman. The team was made up of Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Flash, Batman, Harley Quinn, and Green Lantern. With the exception of Superman, their powers relied mainly on weapons and technology, but primarily they used advanced firearms. Ultimately, they were all slaughtered with this Superman being kidnapped by prophecy, which is a shame because this team looked super cool and they seemed to inhabit a pretty dark and grim looking post-apocalypse. Could have been very interesting. At number eight, we have the Conglomerate. This group is basically a bizarro version of the Justice League created by Booster Gold. The group is formed after Booster's departure from the Justice League International due to a lack of respect from his peers. When Booster first fails to bring together a competent group of heroes to form the first iteration of the Conglomerate, someone named Claire Montgomery comes in to manage the group. With her, she brings along the likes of Deadeye, an alternate Green Arrow, Fiero, a guy with fire powers, Frostbite, an ice power guy, Elastaman, a stretchy man, Element Man, much like Metamorpho, Scarab, a knockoff of Blue Beetle, and Slipstream, a dollar store flash. When they engage in a small friendly skirmish with the Justice League International, the fight quickly turns serious, and everyone learns at once that these new members have actually been brought from an antimatter world world called Quard, and they're basically just entirely evil. And always had been. Luckily the JLI take them down, but it's a close one. Number 7. Squadron Sinister This isn't so much an evil alternate Justice League as this team actually appears in the Marvel Universe. But I'm gonna count it because I'm just stubborn like that. The original Squadron Sinister was created as a sort of obvious play on DC Comics Justice League characters Superman, Batman, Green Lantern, and The Flash, with the characters Hyperion, Nighthawk, Doctor Spectrum, and the hilariously named Wizard, respectively. The team was created by the Grand Master after he encountered the Squadron Supreme, and they first appeared in Avengers number 69, when they were pitted against the Avengers in a game between the Grand Master and Kang the Conqueror. They're bad guys who are our counterparts to four members of the Justice League. I, I gotta stop justifying my reasons. They're on the list. Argue with me down below if you don't like it. All right, at number six, we have the Justice Lords. Appearing in the animated series Justice League in the episode titled A Better World, this evil team is led by a radicalized Superman. Radicalized because he witnesses Lex Luthor murder the Flash and threaten nuclear war. So Superman decides he'd abandon the typical hero's code of conduct and kill the bald tyrant himself. And in this alternate universe, Lex Luthor isn't just some super rich supervillain working away and hiding, he's actually worked his way to becoming the president of the United States. So after his death, there is a power vacuum to be filled. And who would be better rulers than this evil alternate Justice League? No one. They didn't think so anyway, so they take over and put in place a totalitarian government with the justification being that they are protecting humanity from itself. And they start calling themselves the Justice Lords, which, I mean, you should sort of know you're the bad guys when the word Lord is in your title. Luckily, the real Superman is able to catch on and take them out of power before anything goes too far. Number five, Injustice League. Okay, so we have the Crime Syndicate of America, but, there was also a team of villains put together to fight that team of villains. So, sort of technically making these villains heroes, but also not really because they're still villains. Right? The important information here is that the Injustice League, at least the one I'm referring to, was formed to combat the Crime Syndicate of America from Earth 3. The team's villainous members included Bizarro, Black Manta, Black Adam, Catwoman, 
Deathstroke, Sinestro or Parallax, Captain Cold, and they were formed and led by Lex Luthor. The team first appeared in Forever Evil number 3 in January of 2014 when the Crime Syndicate of America invaded the Prime Earth universe and tried, and very nearly did, take over the world. At number 4 we have the Injustice Syndicate. I know, lots of groups with Syndicate and Injustice in their names. Well that's because this evil version of the Justice League actually exists as a sort of combination between the Injustice League and the Crime Syndicate, both of which are included in this list respectively. Appearing in Batman the Brave and the Bold, in the episode called Deep Cover for Batman, Batman manages to travel to their evil dimension and infiltrate their operations disguised as Owlman. He sees that this group comprises of an evil version of himself, along with other evil alternate versions of other heroes he knows and works with. While eavesdropping, Batman learns of their plans to, you know, destroy other universes entirely, which of course, he feels is something he needs to put a stop to. And it can't wait, naturally. So he decides to take all of them on himself, and because he's Batman, and it is his TV show after all, he wins. Those universes can thank him later. Number three, the Joker League. In Emperor Joker number one of October 2000, the Joker has gained 99.99% of the reality warping powers of the fifth dimensional being, Mr. Mixelpitalik. And he used them to completely warp the world into an insane offshoot of our real world. In this Joker world, he has put together an evil, insane version of the Justice League called the Joker League of Anarchy. The team members include some characters we've seen before, such as Bizarro number one, Enigma, who's the Riddler, Gravedigger Lad, who is actually Jimmy Olsen, Lois Lane, Harley Quinn, and Poison Ivy. He has also created completely new characters that are wholly original to this story, Ignition, Bounty, Schism, and Scorch. He even has Lex Luthor as a jester. They are basically just the henchmen of this already pretty much all-powerful version of the Joker. Just another way of keeping him entertained, it seems. At number two, I'm putting the Injustice League from the video game Injustice Gods Among Us. Most of us already know how this story goes, but in case you don't, this is one of the cooler and more well-written storylines about an evil alternate version of the Justice League. In most cases on this list, these evil groups are created by an alternate reality, which is always fun but pretty simple to come up with. But this storyline shows a radicalized Superman leading the Justice League to the dark side. And like I said, this isn't because he's an evil version of Superman or one that's possessed by some evil force. He's genuinely turned to evil after the Joker tricks him into killing Lois Lane. So to combat this new unexpected evil force, Batman decides to bring in other members from the Justice League from another universe and the result is some pretty great fighting gameplay. And right as the game was being released, a comic book series of the same name was also being released in tandem serving as a prequel to the game. Where you can derive general story points from the game itself, most of the backstory I just explained actually comes from the comics. It's cool to see the video game and comic book worlds working in tandem. And they make a pretty cool new storyline that I figure has to be ranked pretty high on this list. Number one, the Crime Syndicate of America. The Crime Syndicate of America hails from the strength-obsessed Earth-3 and is a twisted evil version of many characters who make up the main universe Justice League of America. Its members include Ultraman in place of Superman, Thomas Wayne Jr aka Owlman, and Alfred Pennyworth as the outsider, Superwoman who was Lois Lane at one point and Donna Troy at another, the cowardly Harold Jordan and vengeful John Stewart who are both Power Ring which are evil Green Lanterns at different times, John Allen and John Chambers separately also as Johnny Quick, Atomica, Sea King, Death Storm, Grid, and John Johns. They come into contact with the main universe many, many times, and they almost always spell out bad news, as you'd expect from the antithesis to the Justice League of America. Number 10, Conglomerate. The Justice League doesn't always have to consist of the same roster. I mean, don't get me wrong, I am a huge Batman and Superman fan, but there is also a smaller and less powerful team called Justice League International. And Mark Wade and Rod Wiggum had them face their evil duplicates in 19. In the previous story, Booster Gold had just left the JLI to found his own corporate sponsored team called the Conglomerate. Now that didn't work out too well and the owner decided to pull new heroes out of another reality to form a new conglomerate of Deadeye, who is an alternate Green Arrow, Fiero, an alternate Fire, 
Frostbite, aka Ice, Elastaman, aka Elongated Man, Element Man, aka Metamorpho, Scarab in Alternate Blue Beetle, and Slipstream in Alternate Flash. The conglomerate decided to challenge the JLI to a quote unquote friendly competition that quickly turned violent when they realized the new conglomerate were all from Quard in Evil Antimatter World. The JLI managed to get them back into their own world, but it was a very, very close call to say the least. Check out the first appearance of the conglomerate in 1991's Justice League Quarterly Number 1, or feel free to skip ahead to 1992's Justice League Quarterly Number 8 for the fight of a lifetime. Number 9, The Super Enemies. Starting off our list today with a dark Justice League with no comic origins comes the Super Enemies, an alternate universe version of the Super Friends devoted to the cause of deceit, injustice, and terror. The team consists of Superman, Batman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Robin, Aquaman, Zan, Jaina, and Gleek. However, they have no morals and are just evil mirrored versions of the Super Friends. In the episode they're featured in, the Super Friends meet these evil duplicates in the Hall of Evil, which is their Hall of Justice. The Super Enemies frequently taunt the authorities who are powerless to stop them, although the civilian police are actually equipped to just straight up take them down, as they have kryptonite lasers to stop evil Superman. The Superman of the Super Friends universe first met them when he was mysteriously transported into their universe while trying to stop a volcano from erupting. Well, their Superman was transported into the Super Friends universe. As Superman tried to escape from the Super Enemies and the military armed with kryptonite weapons, the evil Superman was transported to the real universe to fight the Super Friends. Superman Prime ended up getting an antimatter flask that switched them back, which was good news for everyone. And then later on, Lex Luthor organized his own Legion of Doom to be the real anti-Justice League, and it had a much much better name. Check out the one-off appearance of this evil team in 1979 Super Friends episode, Universe of Evil. Number 8, Flashpoint. In an effort to stop his mother's murder, Barry Allen created the Flashpoint timeline, a significantly darker reflection of the main DC universe and one of my favorite DC storylines to date. In this timeline, Thomas Wayne becomes Batman after Bruce is killed instead of him, Wonder Woman is like a tyrannical ruler of the Amazons and is locked in a crazy war with Aquaman because she killed his wife, and Superman is nowhere to be found which means the Justice League technically doesn't exist, and honestly, what's darker than that? Probably a decent amount because this is only number 8, but anyways. If you're not familiar with this timeline, then I highly recommend you check it out for yourself. It is such a good one. All I'll say is that by the end of the series, several major characters are dead, and then in the expanded universe of the Flashpoint timeline, even more characters are revealed to be dead. It's, it's just nuts. Thankfully, Barry managed to fix things before it was too late, but that wasn't enough to erase the Flashpoint timeline completely. Because of that, the DC universe is still dealing with the events of Flashpoint even to this day. Give it a read for yourself, starting with 2011's Flashpoint Volume 2, number 1. Number 7. The Crime Society. Hailing from Earth 3 comes the Crime Society of America, but not to be confused with the Crime Syndicate of America, who we may or may talk about later on. Consisting of Johnny Quick the Second, Owlman the Second, Power Ring, Superwoman, Ultraman, and a few others, this team of villains is basically just evil doppelgangers of the Justice League and the Justice Society. The Crime Society encountered and fought the challengers consisting of Donna Troy, Jason Todd, Kyle Rayner, and Bob the Monitor, and the Jokester. After the challengers and the Jokester escaped to an other universe, the Crime Society were offered a place among Monarch's transdimensional army, which they accepted, of course. The Crime Society went on to fight on Earth-51 and battle the Monitors. When Superboy Prime subsequently caused the destruction of Earth-51's reality, it's unknown if any of the Crime Society were able to actually survive that. Now, while we're waiting to hear their fate, why not check out their story for yourself, starting with 2007's 52, number 52. Number 6, Kingdom Come Justice League. In 1996, Alex Ross and Mark Waite teamed up to create the miniseries Kingdom Come. This miniseries was set in a near future where the traditional heroes of the past came together to stop the brutal superheroes of the new generation. The new Justice League of elderly but still very strong heroes like Superman and Green Lantern set up a prison to hold rogue heroes and supervillains alike. Unfortunately, the gulag erupted in a riot between metahumans that threatened to destroy the entire world, and that caused, let's just say, a little bit more trouble for these geriatric heroes. In an act of desperation, the United Nations launched several nuclear bombs over the gulag site. Batman and Wonder Woman deactivated two of them, but one of them was still primed and falls over the battlefield. Superman attempts to stop the bomb, but Marvel throws him back and stops the bomb himself, detonating it prematurely over the Gulag, killing a lot of the League, Cavalry, and many of the inmates as well. What makes the storyline so dark is that throughout the story, the Justice League struggle to follow their own morals, even as they impose their own brand of justice on a very unhappy world. Batman in particular sided with Lex Luthor to quote unquote liberate mankind from the Justice League. In the end, Superman saw his failure, but only at the cost of thousands of lives. Check out the entire miniseries for yourself, starting with 1996's Kingdom Come, number one. Number five, the Justice Lords. What makes the Justice Lords darker than the other timelines mentioned so far is the fact that the Justice League actually managed to completely rid their world of crime. 
While an absence of crime would be a positive thing for most, it's actually alluded that this version of the Justice League went to pretty extreme measures in order to accomplish such a feat. Appearing in the Justice League animated series episode A Better World, Lex Luthor has become the President of the United States and decided to just execute The Flash. That didn't really sit well with The Flash's friends, which is why an enraged Superman confronted Luthor in the Oval Office. Realizing he would never reform Luthor and keep him from committing such villainous acts, he incinerated him on the spot with his heat vision. With the President out of the way and a new method devised to deal with villains, the Justice League rechristened themselves the Justice Lords and went about establishing a new world order under their quote unquote protection. They eventually came into conflict with the Justice League when they tried to instill their totalitarian rule on the other DC universes, but thankfully they were finally stopped by Superman and his pals, which actually included Lex Luthor who became instrumental in stopping the Justice Lords and stripping them of their power. Check out this episode for yourself in 2003's Justice League Season 2, Episode 22 and 23 as well. Number 4, The Injustice League Back in 1988, we got introduced to a new version of the Justice League known as the Injustice League. This ragtag group consisted entirely of criminals who never actually made it big in their various enterprises, and determined to make it big, they just banded together and became the rather ineffective Injustice League. Major Disaster, Big Stir, Clue Master, Multi Man, Clock King, and the Mighty Bruce are what made up the roster. They barely managed to pull off any capers and mostly just got their butts kicked. All enough though, after 2000's Silver Age, the showcase number one came out, it retroactively made 1989's Injustice League the second version of the team. The quote unquote original team was brought together in the Silver Age by the evil intergalactic Agamemno who used Lex Luthor to recruit other villains like Black Manta, Bizarro, and the Joker. This Injustice League was way more effective and even managed to switch minds with the JLA on one occasion. When the Justice League managed to switch back, they erased the memory of the event from the villains' minds completely. Check out these two teams in 1989's Justice League International number 23 or head over to 2000's Silver Age Showcase number 1. Number 3, Injustice Justice League. Now I think everyone can agree that no other timeline has featured more DC character deaths than the Injustice timeline. After the Joker takes virtually everything from Superman, the Man of Steel finally cracks and just kills the Clown Prince of Crime. From there, heroes continue to devolve into their worst selves with a fair split maintaining their moral codes and principles. In the video game and comic franchise Injustice Gods Among Us, the Justice League still calls themselves by that same name, eventually changing it to the regime though. But that's about the only similarity between the two universes because the Injustice universe is about as dark as it can get. Superman loses his cool and just thrusts his hand through the clown's chest after the Joker destroys Metropolis, killing Lois Lane. As you might imagine, this not only kills the Joker, but surprises Batman and everyone else around him. Superman decides he is fed up with the old way of doing things and sets out to create a new world order under his totalitarian rule. Superman reforms the League after opposing Batman and many of his other former friends. In the end, it's actually the Dark Knight who succeeds in recruiting Superman from the regular DC Universe, who comes in to defeat his darker alter self. Now, if you're not familiar with this storyline, check it out for yourself starting with 2013's Injustice Gods Among Us number one, or honestly, just head back and play through the games one more time. Number two, the new Reichman. Ever wonder what would happen if Superman didn't crash land in Kansas and instead he crash landed in, I don't know, Germany? Well, wonder no longer because on Earth 10, that is the reality. On Earth 10, the Germans use Superman, known as Overman in this universe, to win World War II and basically take over the world. As a champion of Germania and the leader of the New Reichmen, Overman is accompanied by Brunhilde, Earth 10's Wonder Woman, Leatherwing, aka Batman, Blitzen, aka The Flash, The Martian, Martian Manhunter, Underwater Man, aka Aquaman, and Overgirl, aka Supergirl, who was unfortunately killed in battle. Alongside the German forces, Overman conquered the world in less than 20 years, after which he decided to leave the Earth for a while. Three years later, he returned with a clear head and saw all of the damage he helped cause and became an advocate against all that he once stood for, well, still working alongside them for some reason. Eventually, German scientists used callous cells to create a clone of him known as Overgirl that Overman loved like family, however, she died not too long after her creation and this hit him hard. Inconsolable and grief-stricken, Overman leaked some precious information to the Freedom Fighters that resulted in the demise of the new Reichman and Metropolis as well. Check out probably one of the saddest Superman stories I have ever heard, starting with 2015's The Multiversity Guidebook, number one. And number one, The Crime Syndicate of America. Consisting of Ultraman, Owlman, Superwoman, Johnny Quick, and the Power Ring, the Crime Syndicate of America is the first alternate version of the Justice League to ever come to life following the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. That event erased the multiverse but left the Antimatter universe, also known as the Quardian universe within DC's continuity. Within the Antimatter universe, the Crime Syndicate existed as an evil version of our favorite superheroes, only they were far more dastardly than their previous versions. With virtually no one to oppose them, they managed to establish and maintain control over a large portion of their Earth. 
Eventually, they grew bored of their Earth, and the crime syndicate began kidnapping people from the 52 multiverse matter based worlds and were visited by our Justice League to retrieve the people from the Justice League Earth that have been kidnapped. Fast forward past some pretty sweet fights, and we see Owlman along with Superwoman and Ultraman banished to a prison subdimension while Johnny Quick and the current Power Ring were captured. Highly recommend you check out the storyline for yourself, so check it all out in their first appearance in 2000's JLA Earth number 2. Number 10, The Three Jokers. At the bottom of our list is The Three Jokers story. This is because it isn't canon to the main DC universe, but the setup is. When Batman became the god of knowledge by sitting on the Mobius chair, he became able to find out the answer to any question he asked. One of the first things he wanted to know was the true identity of his arch enemy, the Joker. To his surprise, the chair informed him that the Joker was actually three different men. This was never really explored in main continuity, but in the Black Label story, the three Jokers, we learned that the reason the Joker acts so differently depending on the day is that Batman has been dealing with three different Jokers, known as the Clown, who was the Joker who killed Jason Todd, the Comedian, the Joker who shot and paralyzed Barbara Gordon, and the Criminal, who seems to be the Golden Age version of the character. The writer, Jeff Johns, stated that it was because it was so revolutionary it would be out of canon with the option of bringing it into the main universe once fans inevitably loved it. Comparing his story to Alan Moore's The Killing joke, which went through a similar process. Personally, I think it's best this stays in Elseworlds, as it just opens up too many questions about Batman's already kinda weird continuity. Number 9, Martian Manhunter. Put some respect on my boy's name. In the new 52 era, one of the biggest changes made to the Justice League was that Martian Manhunter was not a founding member of the team, a place that he held for years. Instead, his spot was taken by Cyborg, who was now created thanks to a mother box. This had a ripple effect of changing the important place Place Cyborg held in the Teen Titans, meaning it was a race completely. I personally liked the change a little bit. I always have felt that Cyborg has been a little underappreciated, so to make him a founding member felt like a huge step up for his character, who is one of my favorites. But at the same time, John is also one of my favorites. It's just that his status as a newly arrived alien from Mars made it make more sense that Cyborg, who has lived a relatively normal human life on Earth, should be the one of the original defenders of the planet. It may be a weak argument, and I know that many people weren't too happy with the changes to both the JLA and the Titans. Let me know your thoughts. Number 8. Hal Jordan From Hero to Villain to Host Hal Jordan was one of the most beloved and respected members of the Green Lantern Corps. When his home, Coast City, was destroyed by super villains, he was consumed by grief. He tried to recreate his city and its inhabitants with his ring, but as this was against the ring rules, he was summoned by the Guardians of the Universe for judgment. He snapped and killed pretty much the entire Green Lantern Corps, taking their rings in hopes of becoming so powerful that he could restart the universe and save his city. He started calling himself Parallax and was now a villain. He eventually learned the error of his ways and sacrificed himself to save the day and died. DC eventually wanted to bring him back as Green Lantern, but realized that would be really hard with him having committed so much genocide since he was a hero. They retconned it so that he was actually being influenced by a yellow fear demon named Parallax who had taken over his mind. This allowed Hal to rejoin the Green Lanterns, be a member of the Justice League, and become the Lantern's golden boy again by absolving him of any responsibility for his actions. Number 7, The Justice Society. One of the most hated retcons to come out of the New 52 was that DC made it so that the Justice Society of America, a well respected Respected team that included popular characters from the golden age of comics that was a huge part of DC's comic book history both in the actual continuity and real life had just never existed. It's just such an odd choice as the legacy aspect of DC comics that these characters served as the basis for was just completely wiped out. That legacy concept had done so well for DC prior to the past decade so it seemed like such a strange choice to make. DC made a few weird choices with regards to retcons created during the new 52. Some were loved, some were not. But to Fans, this one seemed just straight up rude. Just because Jay Garrick and Alan Scott are old news doesn't mean they aren't as important. Respect your elders, DC. Come on! Number 6 Tim Drake. Robin no more? When the DC Universe rebooted into the New 52 continuity, DC Editorial wanted to make their heroes younger and changed the continuity so that the Justice League had only been operating for five years. If they had wanted to start the New 52 with Batman working solo or with Dick Grayson still being Robin, this probably would have worked. But DC wanted to have their cake and eat it too, wanting a younger Batman, but still wanting to use characters like Nightwing and Jason Todd. In order to accommodate the new timeline, retcons to the 
various Robins backstories had to be made. Dick and Jason got away relatively unscathed, but Tim Drake got the short end of the stick. Tim was originally introduced after Jason Todd had died at the hands of the Joker. Batman was acting recklessly and Tim deduced that Batman was Bruce Wayne. Believing that Batman needs a Robin to temper his aggression, he asked Dick to become Robin again, but ended up getting the gig himself, being the main boy wonder from 1990 until 2009 when Damian Wayne became the new Robin and Tim Drake became Red Robin. In New 52 canon, he never quite figured out Batman's identity and was never Robin, having apparently always been Red Robin. Fans hated this and his original origin was eventually put back into canon. Another consequence of the New 52 was that in order to explain how Batman had a 10 year old son, Damian was retconned to be a genetically engineered baby who had grown faster than normal. Number 5. Identity Identity Crisis was a really engaging mystery story that paid great close attention to comic book history, but unfortunately, it is another one of DC's strange retconning events that changed quite a few things that left readers completely flabbergasted. Whether it was the super unnecessary and inappropriate use of Dr. Light's attack on Sue Dibney, which itself was an example of the crappy way women were treated in comic book stories in order to motivate the male hero, aka fridging, or the Justice League approved mind wipes that seemed kind of evil in the grand scheme of things. Sure, wiping Dr. Light's mind and turning him into essentially an idiot for what he did maybe seemed darkly justified, but wiping Batman as well? It caused Bruce to create the Brother MK1 satellite, which eventually became Brother I and created the Omax. Catwoman also suspected that her personality shift from villain to basically a hero might not have been her own choice. It caused the villain community to band together over the fear of being mind wiped, leading Lex Luthor to create the society, and it even caused the falling apart of the Justice League. Also, can DC stop calling every damn event a crisis? I am in crisis just trying to keep track of them all. Number four. Jay Garrick Fictional or nah? When Barry Allen was introduced in 1956 as a reinvention of the Flash, they explained that in Barry's universe, the original Flash, Jay Garrick, and all of his adventures were the fictional exploits of a comic book superhero that Barry liked growing up. So when Barry got powers, he took on the identity to honor him, making the Flash a cosplayer. This was retconned in the iconic Flash of Two Worlds story from 1961's Flash number 123, where Barry accidentally was transported to Jay's world. He learned that Jay was in a different universe, and that the comics written by Gardner Fox were actually dreams that he had remembered and written down. As Barry explained, obviously when the writer was asleep his mind was turned in on Jay's vibratory earth. This was a weird way to incorporate Jay Garrick, but it also had long running effects on the larger DC universe as this is also the introduction of the DC multiverse. Number 3. Jason Todd Ah, yes, the over-aggressive black sheep of the Bat family. The poster boy for toxic Batman fans everywhere, and the most lazily written Robin of the bunch. At least at first. When Jason Todd first showed up on the scene, after the Robin mantle was abandoned by Dick Grayson, it was downhill from the start. For starters, DC made his backstory almost identical to that of Dick himself. Jason was part of a circus that was attacked by Killer Croc, which resulted in the passing of his parents, and that is when Batman took him under his wing and trained him to be Robin. Ah. This time it's the Killer Croc's fault. Very original, DC. I see what you did there. Very nice, yes. So already this Robin seemed to be the target of Batman for being exactly like his beloved Dick Grayson. But Jason wasn't Grayson, obviously. In a retcon, he was made to be impulsive, reckless, and rageful, probably because his mentor wanted the old guy back. I'd be mad too. Now, his backstory was reworked to make him a tough street kid whose parents succumbed to a life of crime and substances, but that's not the weird retcon. After his passing at the hands of the Joker, and technically at the hands of the fans, and after his resurrection as the Red Hood, he revealed to his sidekick that the cause of his streak of white hair was the fact that Batman had made the young Robin dye his hair from red to black in order to make him look more like Dick and avoid anyone asking about this new Robin's identity. Sure, it makes some sense, but my god, Batman needs to learn how to be a better Bat Dad. Number 2. Punching Reality In one of DC Comics' first and largest moves, the publisher removed all of the parallel Earths that they created during the bronze, silver, and golden age of comics in the Crisis on Infinite Earths. This was controversial even at the time, as it was a huge move that was meant to streamline their continuity and bring everything into one Earth. Unfortunately, the whole move was pretty pointless because it didn't take DC long to go back on that idea and 
retcon it, but they did it in what was honestly an incredibly odd way. We're talking comic books here, so there is a large suspension of disbelief that needs to take place, but making Superboy Prime punch reality just seems on another level. Being from an alternate reality himself, he got so mad at the current state of affairs in the DC Universe that he punched a hole in reality which created the multiverse again and started the incredibly complex history of DC continuity, which only recently was reverted so that literally everything is canon if you want it to be. We did a whole explained on the DC continuity, so if you want to check that out, we will add a link for you right somewhere over here. Number one, Hawkman's origin. Hawkman has one of the most notoriously difficult origins to keep track of in all of comics, so I will be giving you an abridged version of his history. In his original 1940 origin, he is Egyptian royalty who has been reincarnated throughout time as a variety of different heroes before eventually becoming the archaeologist Carter Hall, spelled like this. Carter becomes Hawkman and fights crime. With me so far? When reintroduced in 1961, he is an alien cop from the planet planet Thanagar named Carter Hall, spelt like this. He comes to Earth and takes on the secret identity of an archaeologist named Carter Hall, with the original spelling. It makes sense when you think of him as a total reinvention of the original character. Where things start to get confusing is two years later when we learn that the two different versions are actually multiversal variants of each other, with the alien living on Earth 1 and the original archaeologist being on Earth 2. In 1986, the crisis on infinite Earths happens, and all of the worlds are combined into one. How to handle the continuity? Well. They changed it so that they were two different people who just happened to have similar sounding names and were both Hawkman at different points in history, with the original operating in the 40s and the alien operating in the 80s. In 1994, Zero Hour happens and all of the various Hawkmen become one guy, but it doesn't stick. In 2011, the New 52 retcons Hawkman so that he has always been a space cop from Thanagar. In 2017, Carter with a C is reintroduced, with it being explained that he reincarnates because the knife he was killed with in Egypt was made of nth metal from a Thanagarian ship, kind of introducing elements of both of the origins. In 2018, we learn that the two versions have become one again, with the space cop being one of Carter with a C's reincarnations, retconning the character to be able to be reborn not just in different eras on Earth, but on other planets as well. So to sum it up briefly, reincarnated Pharaoh becomes space cop, becomes two different people. He's retconned to have only ever been a space cop and is retconned one last time to be a reincarnated pharaoh who in one of his lives was an alien space cop. Which when you say it like that makes perfect sense. By the way, most of this can also be applied to Hawkgirl. Kicking off the list at number 10, Diana gets ahead of the game. One of the changes to reality that occurs during the Flashpoint event is when Wonder Woman and Aquaman get married. I mean it's great. I mean well not really. I mean weddings are fun I guess. I don't know. I, I hear shout and then I black out. It's so weird how that works. So this is the reality now where Bruce Wayne was shot and not his parents. And if that wasn't wild enough, Superman is now in a government lab having a not so relaxing time. And then we see Diana being saved by a sea monster from Aquaman. How lovely. A nice thing. This is great. We have nice things in this list already. Lovely. Ah yes, classic Wonder Woman. Nice. Nothing like getting cheated on and then having your head cut off. Adding injury to insult this time. And then she pops her crown off of her severed head and then places it nicely on her own head. A war of course follows between the Atlanteans and the Amazons, but it comes to a lovely conclusion when Wonder Woman stabs Aquaman in the back. And yes, I mean literally in a sense. And before we go on to number nine, guys, if you want to go ahead and give this video a like, that would be great. You're the best. Thank you so much for watching. Let's pop right back into number nine right off the bat. Let's keep going. Number nine. Lockdown Beatdown. Kingdom Come is a four issue mini series that comes from Mark Wade and Alex Ross. It's an Elseworlds imprint. Now, in this alternate reality, 20 years into the future, our heroes have gotten a little older, so they settled into their retirement life. Now, these new anti heroes stepped up, and new vigilantes, of course, soon followed. Some of them were children of the previous superheroes, so it goes kind of deep. See, Parasite breaks open a hero named Captain Adam, and you already know by his name how that's gonna turn out if something like that were to explode. Boom! There goes. Kansas gone. No, literally Kansas was gone. It was now just this wasteland. So this is when the Justice League comes in to save the day, or I guess turn the wasteland into a super prison too. That, that as well. So when you throw super villains and superheroes into this alien tech super prison, there's gonna be a few fist fights, that's for sure. Number eight, hard feelings. This next one isn't exactly a bad deed, but it's too weird of a Justice League story to not include. So I'm gonna 
throw it in at number nine. One I'd rather not have in my brain all day, so let's just get it out of the way. So now we go to World's Finest Comics issue 289. So Batman and Superman decide to catch up on some bro time, you know, take a break from beating up bad guys, just have a heart to heart. See what's going on? in here. Now this heart to heart is the start of a wild adventure. Now the issue is titled The Krill Way of Dying and the dialogue itself is really good stuff actually. It highlights the mental health struggles that superheroes go through, you know, not being able to save everybody. It's meaningful, it's powerful dialogue. But what takes this issue to new heights, well rather new lows, is when Superman and Batman are interrupted by a meteorite crashing and out of the meteorite emerges the crew. Now the crew, not what you imagine in your head off the bat. I can tell you that because the crew uh, they're a bunch of space worms and they're attracted to sadness. That's how they found the two because they were talking about super sad stuff and they're like Yes, sad. This way. Let's go. Let's head it. Their super depression was literally glowing. So these aliens need emotion in order to pass away. See what happens when you try and feel nice things, Justice League? Way to go. Now we're all crying. I'm definitely crying. They're crying. They're dead. Space worms are coming for me because I'm crying now. What a vicious circle. Number seven, Batman ignores Blue Beetle. So back in Countdown to Infinite Crisis, Blue Beetle had actually approached his super friends and teammates after he had discovered something called the OMAC Project. So he brought it to Batman's attention, but Bruce just doesn't really give a damn at this point. He brushes him off almost immediately. Well, the OMAC Project, of course, turned out to be something, and when Blue Beetle discovered it, he's all by himself, and he doesn't live to tell the tale. If only Batman just took him seriously in this moment, things would have turned out a lot less ugly for him. I mean, I know Batman created this thing in the first place, so it's kind of fair that he didn't listen to him, but like before Infinite Crisis, the Omax killed a lot of people. Shouldn't have just given him like two minutes to maybe explain. And the fact that Batman didn't just listen to his team member, especially when he already knew something was kind of going on, sounds like it's all on you, Batman. I don't want to be the guy to say it, but I was just the guy to say it. Number six, Tower of Babel. JLA Tower of Babel is a Justice League storyline, and one of the best storylines, in my humble opinion, written by Mark Wade and illustrations by Howard Porter, Batman is the greatest detective alive. Odds are, if you're ever in a room with Batman, he's already thought out your every move and he's planned his accordingly. He's always two steps ahead. That's what makes him the best. He also just happens to be the sole reason that everything goes in this storyline. He doesn't mean to, but it happens. So Ra's al Ghul and the League of Assassins launched this huge simultaneous attack on every member of the Justice League of America. Now the attacks are so specific, they're aware of the weakness of each League member. Now Batman was once worried that one or all of them could go rogue at any point, so he had contingency plans in order to take them out if that day ever came. So Talia al Ghul broke into the Batcave and stole those files. So if you want to take down some bad guys, here's exactly how to do it. Thanks, Batman. The best files ever. Now we have all the deepest, darkest secrets. Cool. So Plastic Man gets frozen and then shattered. A specifically designed Vibra bullet hits the Flash in the neck and causes him to have seizures at light speed, which sounds like an absolute nightmare. And Superman gets exposed to red kryptonite, and sadly, many more get hit too. Number five, Wonder Woman hunts the Huntress. The Injustice universe shows us a different side to our team members, sometimes a little darker than we're ready for. So in issue 21 of Injustice Gods Among Us Year 3, we find our main supers in a world that's not so bright. And when it comes to issue 21 of Injustice Year 3, DC shows us yet again how great Wonder Woman is at cracking that lasso of truth. It's just a matter of of where she cracked it, that was the problem. Well, she wraps it around the neck of the Huntress and the crack that we hear is exactly what you think. Bam. So Batgirl calls her out for being a murderer, even though she really didn't mean to do it. Accidents happen, especially in the middle of a battle. You know, it happens. I mean, the tension was high. The Huntress was punching through shields. Wonder Woman just reacted in a violent way. It happens, you're a superhero. I remember one time I, I wrist shot an orange hockey ball through a garage door thing. It's like, you know what? When you're in the middle of it, accidents happen. You get crazy. Number four, get a room. Look guys, superheroes have emotions just like us, okay? They meet other superheroes and they take down bad guys together. They hook up in the sky in the owl ship above the rest of the world. They're just like us, okay? Sometimes key intimate moments are hard to conceal when you have the powers of a god, right? Specifically Wonder Woman and Superman. So after the triumph, that is the Dark Knight Returns, Frank Miller decided to dive into an intimate moment with those two. So Wonder Woman and Superman embrace in each other, but where does this happen? In a fancy hotel? Fortress of Solitude? No and no. They get it on up there, in the sky, of course, where everyone can see and hear. So they're superheroes, so this caused massive tidal waves. Volcanoes are blasting off, people are even evacuating islands. Like, this is a bad day. I mean, bad day for everybody but Superman and Wonder Woman. They look like they had a great time. 
Number three, Superman moves Atlantis. Injustice Gods Among Us issue 12 is the final issue of the first Injustice comic series written by Tom Taylor. And we see Aquaman just unleash the ultimate pain. He's not having an easy go at this time. He's unleashing armies on coastal cities. He's trying to show Superman that he has the power as well, and that he's not gonna allow Atlantis to be taken over. So Superman is like, okay, you think you're the tough dude? No problem. Let me step in. Superman sees this as a threat, and even Batman's like, great, this is exactly what I thought was gonna happen between these two. So Superman doesn't just fly in, fight Aquaman one-on-one, -on -one, and then settle their differences with this whole ordeal. No, instead, Arthur gets the help of Wonder Woman and Green Lantern, and they literally move Atlantis. They move Atlantis like it's new furniture. Pivot! They move it to the Sahara Desert, the place with the least amount of water possible. Not cool, guys, not cool. Number two, Superman outs Batman. So in the climax of Batman vs Superman, we see Bruce Wayne straight up try and take out the Man of Steel. It's intense, and it ends with Superman not surviving in a way, but then, until he comes back in the Justice League movie. Spoilers. So if you're feeling a little upset about that, this next one should turn the tables in your mind. Superman once outed Batman, and he did it in a pretty hilarious way. Through social media, of course, of course. Did he make a TikTok? No. Was it through Ask FM? No and no. It was in the pages of Injustice God among Us issue 10. I mentioned this comic earlier because it has our super friends going against each other, but Superman takes it up to the next level when he posts Batman's true identity online. His tweet was quite simple and to the point. Batman is Bruce Wayne. 1.5 million retweets, not too shabby at all. Batman's trending on Twitter in real life almost like once a week, so I'm just waiting for the day when I look and I'm like, yes, Batman is real. And he's Paul Giamatti, get out of here. I knew it, I knew it. Number one, Justice Lords. The DCAU introduced us to the Justice Lords back in November 2003 in an episode titled A Better World. Was it a better world? No, definitely not. They were a multiversal counterpart of the Justice League. This is an alternate universe now, one where Lex Luthor is the current president of the United States. The Justice Lords were assembled to protect humanity from itself, which just sounds like bad news. That sounds like a bad story in the making. So yeah, they were robot replicas of Superman, and the inmates of Arkham Asylum were brainwashed and lobotomized. Just not an ideal world at all. Definitely not a better one. And then when the Justice Lords of this universe found out they weren't alone, they tried to bring their ways of heroics over to our world. But our good Justice League took them down with the help of our Lex Luthor, who used the Power Disruptor to neutralize their super abilities. So it's like good Lex, bad Lex, good team, bad team, mind explosion. The idea of a rogue team member is terrifying, but a rogue team, ah, oh, what a nightmare. How do you stop them? Well guys, there you have it. Which of these moments from your favorite Justice League members do you wish never happened at all? Honestly, seeing the Huntress get her neck cracked that fast, I didn't see that coming at all. That was wild. Canon or not, that's living in my head rent free now. That's scary. Maybe it's because I have a long neck. Those comics hit me deep. I don't know. In a tent joining Reverse Flash. In Tales from the Dark Multiverse 1, Flashpoint, we see a world where Barry Allen died while attempting to get his speed back with Thomas Wayne in the Flashpoint timeline. This leads to Reverse Flash claiming to be the Flash and trying to end the the war with the Atlanteans and Amazons by threatening them. <laughs> Obviously this doesn't work out because they're the goddamn Atlanteans and Amazons. So in an effort to save himself, Reverse Flash races through time changing events to create the world exactly how he wants it, which involves saving not only Bruce Wayne, but Martha and Thomas Wayne as well, resulting in a world without a Batman. Because you know, Batman's gonna fight against Reverse Flash no matter what. So just getting rid of Batman, this is the smartest thing any villain has ever done, straight up. But on the final page of this issue, we see Eobard with all the new heroes he ended up creating and convincing them to join him, as we can see by the reverse flash symbols on their suits. Even Green Lanterns and Wonder Woman has one. This page also has a Superman and honestly, sick suit, but being controlled or I guess led by the reverse flash makes this utterly horrifying to think about, especially when you can see the other members of the Flash family racing behind reverse flash like he finally got what he wanted Eobard became the flash and now he has his own justice league that serves his own purposes that should this should have been higher <laughs> and at nine exposed Batman while this seems like something any version of Superman would do if they turned bad, it's actually interesting to see that only the Injustice version of Superman actually did it. Yes, after getting fed up of Batman leading the resistance against his totalitarian regime, because you know, that's a bad thing Bruce, Superman tells the whole world that Batman is really Bruce Wayne. How does he do this you may ask? Uh, like a press conference, or like a, a world, world message, or like a video? No. None of the above. The dude just freaking 
tweets. <laughs> Superman, in just four simple words, tells the world that Batman is Bruce Wayne. Using those four words, actually, in that order. From the official Superman Twitter account, by the way. Dude doesn't even use his Clark Kent Twitter. I, like, he's still hiding behind his identity, but he decides to out Bruce's. That's, that's hypocrisy right there. But I guess that's all politicians. With over 2.5 million retweets and over 3.5 million favorites, this is certainly number one on trending for sure. At least until Kim K posts a pic in like a sexy Batman costume so that the whole Bruce is actually Batman thing moves to number two and then the whole internet breaks again. In a day, put Atlantis in the desert. Superman has his dark moments in Injustice. This especially includes Injustice Gods Among Us number 12. Written by Tom Taylor with art from Mike Miller and Tom Dennerick. Injustice Gods Among Us 12 shows readers Aquaman unleashing Atlantean armies on coastal cities around the globe as a way to show Superman that, you know, this it's not gonna happen. Atlantis will not be taken. Superman, of course, takes this as a threat because he of course he does, and you know, Batman knew this would happen. But Aquaman, being Aquaman, refuses to back down, and Superman decides to teach him a lesson. But rather than actually like attacking and probably killing Aquaman, Superman enlists the help of Wonder Woman and the Green Lantern to literally lift Atlantis from the ocean and set it down in the middle of the Sahara Desert. As far from water as he could possibly get on Earth. Honestly, he might as well just put them in space. All of that would just be like direct murder and everyone would have gotten mad at that. But like honestly, I don't think Superman is above that. This guy is a freaking monster. And it's seven killing Green Arrow. Being as powerful as he is, it's important that Superman keeps a tight grip on his sanity and his powers because, you know. A huge part of the reason that Clark trusts Bruce with shards of kryptonite is because he knows that he can end up being used as a weapon or just going crazy if Lois dies. <laughs> In this case, he wants Batman to stop him using that kryptonite. However, when Superman goes too far, sometimes nobody's actually there to stop him. In Injustice Gods Among Us number 11, the issue before Superman dropped Atlantis in the Sahara Desert. When the Green Arrow is trying to distract Superman, he fires an arrow at him that bounces off Superman because, you know, it's not a kryptonite arrow, but then it hits his father, Jonathan Kent, in the shoulder. It doesn't kill him. He's fine. He just got shot in the shoulder, but Superman gets so enraged at this that he flies at Green Arrow and immediately starts beating him to death in a furious rage. I mean, like, killing him would be one thing because he's Oliver Queen and he's, like, one of the sexiest men alive, but brutally beating him is something else entirely, especially with his mother yelling at him, begging for him to stop. Like, dude, listen to your mom. She knows best. Eat your vegetables. And it's six, Batman's backup plan. At this point, it's pretty well known that Bruce Wayne kept files and tools to destroy each of the members of the Justice League if it was necessary. Though Clark, like I said, wants Batman to have this ability since he fears himself if he ends up getting manipulated or whatnot, like literally every time Brainiac shows up. But the other Justice League members have not given Batman their information or like been like, yeah, man, you can do that. In JLA, The Tower of Babel by Mark Wade and Howard Porter, Batman is shown to keep secret records of how to completely destroy each and every member of the Justice League. These records are then taken by Ra's al Ghul and used to decimate the League, proving an ultimate betrayal on the part of Bruce Wayne. Okay, I get it. Like, I understand the desire to be prepared since, you know, people in this universe seem to be turned by villains like Brainiac on a regular basis, but that's that's what Task Force X is for. That's why we have a whole game called Kill the Justice League. You don't need to have like a super secret, this is how you kill all of us hard drive that just begs for every single villain to try and steal it. Like it's kind of stupid how you thought that was a good idea. All you need to do is have it in your brain. You're the world's greatest detective and you couldn't detect that that was a bad idea. Halfway through in number 5, Wonder Woman destroying the Justice League. When it comes to power and skill levels, Wonder Woman is arguably one of the strongest members of the Justice League. Characters like Superman and Martian Manhunter may have incredible power as aliens, and Superman, especially, may well just be the most powerful hero of all, but Wonder Woman is also basically a deity, at least being a god adjacent, because, you know, she's an Amazon. She's one of DC's most powerful heroes, if not their most powerful hero, especially if Kryptonite's around, and she has to keep her 
your abilities and powers in check, much like how Spider-Man always has to pull his punches so he doesn't kill someone. However, in a one shot called JLA A League of One, written by Christopher Moeller, Wonder Woman realizes that the Justice League are just holding her back. She realizes that the entire League will be destroyed if she doesn't stop them herself, so she takes on each member of the Justice League and takes them down on her own so that she can act individually. Kind of like a mini version of Marvel's Civil War, but on a much smaller and less daunting scale. Though understandable, this is still an initial betrayal and a major hurt. Luckily for Wonder Woman, her team does forgive her because, you know, she didn't actually kill them. Maybe she was just having a midlife crisis, we don't know. In it 4, Aquaman and Wonder Woman War. Ha, <laughs> it rhymes. Ah, look at that, I managed to squeeze two flashpoint numbers onto this list, hell yeah. I mean, they're different flashpoints, but still. In the animated The Flashpoint Paradox movie in the DC Animated Universe, the world is much different to its CW counterpart, and, like, kinda, the the general DC universe, mostly due to the war between Aquaman and Wonder Woman who end up being the villains of the movie, thanks to them being former lovers while Aquaman was married to Mira, and then Wonder Woman then killed Mira when she tried to get revenge for her sleeping with her husband. But to be fair, um, she also wears Mira's crown after she kills her, so it's not really like it was like, oh yeah, it was self-defense. However, this war actually resulted in the destruction of the planet at the exact moment that Barry was able to get enough speed back to get back into the speed force and set everything straight. It's a really suspenseful moment where Reverse Flash had just been killed by Batman, so Barry would have enough speed to run back and stop him Himself from saving his mother, he managed to get into the Speed Force just before the world's destruction caught up with him. It's absolutely insane. It's very um, Justice League Zack Snyder cut-esque. However, I'm pretty sure they got it from this movie either way. He managed to get back into the Speed Force before the world's destruction and then the world was destroyed. But so yeah, it's a bad thing, okay? Even if the Justice League isn't really a thing in this universe, it was still their fault. <laughs> Getting close to the end, in at number three, Injustice. I think the whole Injustice Earth is enough of a sin to earn a spot on this list. Just the entirety of the Injustice world is truly an injustice. In a parallel universe, the Joker tricks Superman into killing his pregnant wife, Lois Lane, and detonating a nuclear weapon that destroys Metropolis, killing millions of people. Mad with grief and rage, and because, you know, Lois Lane died in this universe, Superman goes dark and murders the Joker, quickly losing Using his moral compass. Five years after this moment, Superman has formed the One Earth Regime to enforce global peace through fear, and rules the Earth as a ruthless dictator with an iron fist. Or I guess a steel fist. Get it? Because he's the man of steel? Anyway, alongside many other heroes and villains, he recruited or forced into joining him and killing any who oppose him. Batman ends up establishing the Insurgency, which is actually supposed to oppose Superman's regime, and then that's why he exposes his identity. But then the ensuing war between the factions just leaves the Justice League disbanded. But either way, this is probably one of the darkest timelines. Penultimately, in a number two, ruled the world. Usually, when people talk about Superman ruling the world, they're talking about injustice. And while that is a great story and an example of what can go wrong with superheroes, the story of the king of the world is actually a good cautionary tale about Superman other than Injustice. In the late 90s, this story features a series of prophecy-like dreams that makes Superman realize that his regular MO of just flying around and waiting for disasters to happen isn't really working. And Kal-El decides to be a little more, um, proactive. In this case, that means building a series of spy satellites to survey Earth, helping Superman keep track of everything that's happening all at once, and then giving up his life as Clark Kent to work as Superman full time. Sleep deprived and losing his grip on humanity, Superman starts interfering more and more in Earth's affairs, toppling extremist governments and even changing the weather. <laughs> When he realizes that he still can't be everywhere at once though, the Man of Steel deploys an army of Superman robots to help maintain law and order. Again, making him a benevolent dictator. Only snapping out of it when he gets a kiss from Lois Lane. None of the Justice League really tries to stop him either. They just kind of accept it, which is surprising, especially for Batman. Although I find it funny how the Man of Steel deployed Men of Steel. And finally, in at number one, getting Alfred killed. Look, after Bruce Wayne loses his parents, Thomas and Martha, he's a young boy, okay? The only person who can truly take care of Bruce is Alfred Pennyworth. 
the Wayne family butler. However, Alfred ends up becoming like a second father to Bruce, raising him to adulthood and caring for him throughout his entire life. He also cares for Bruce's children as a grandfather and sometimes even more of a father than Bruce to them. Alfred is incredibly important to Bruce and probably the only family that the man truly has left. But in Injustice Year 5, number 23, Alfred is spending his birthday alone at Wayne Manor. Unbeknownst to him, Superman has sent the supervillain Victor Zass to interrogate him, an altercation which will ultimately result in Alfred's death. I know it was the Injustice Earth, okay, and Supes is a horrible person there, but honestly, think about it. This is the worst thing that Superman and by proxy his Injustice League has ever done. Because Alfred is the purest character in all of DC Comics. And in the moment that Alfred died, so did a piece of the DC Universe. It doesn't matter if it was in one of Infinite Earths and it was one of Infinite Alfreds. None of them deserved this. And at number 10, Jason Todd's hair. This one's a little less stressful than our last number. Back when Jason Todd was first introduced in the comics in 1983, it was as Dick Grayson's replacement, with the former Robin now heading the Teen Titans team. While it was a great thing that the new Teen Titans title was selling, DC felt that Batman may suffer from this, and introduced a brand new Robin that debuted in Batman issue 357. In his first few appearances, he was distinguished from Dick Grayson by having strawberry red hair, which was later changed because the character lacked popularity. So DC strove to make Jason Todd a little bit more like Dick. While that's technically a retcon in itself, perhaps what's even better is the fact that this change in hair color is something Todd would later on address after he was brought back from the dead. More on that later. Todd would admit that when he was Robin, Batman made him dye his hair to look more like Dick Grayson. While he never gives a full reason for Bruce making him do this, it's implied it's some sort of marketing ploy. But really, it just kind of feels like Batman fetishized Grayson, if we're being honest. Moving on to number nine. Joe Chill who? One character that is critical to the Batman mythos but is constantly subjected to changes is Joe Chill, the petty criminal who killed Bruce Wayne's parents in that alleyway when he was a boy. For starters, Joe Chill being the one responsible was briefly retconned in the 90s with Zero Hour, and the truth was left hanging for years concerning whether or not Chill was really the one behind the Wayne's deaths. Then in 2006 Infinite Crisis issue 6, he was confirmed to be their killer once again. But Let's backtrack a little. This is where it gets annoying, frustrating, and a little scary, if messing with continuity or the thought of doing so is something that is frightful to you, which it should be, especially considering all of the mess that DC has created with Joe Chill. The way in which Batman discovers that Joe is his parents' killer has changed time and time again. It seems as if every several years we get a new take on Bruce's origin story, and him confronting Joe, or him rediscovering that Joe was the one who pulled the trigger, or him hunting him down and having some big moral dilemma about the whole darn thing. There have been multiple variations pertaining to Joe Chill's fate, various suspects, various storylines in which DC characters have believed to find new evidence, and then hunted down the real person responsible. Initially, we got a glimpse of this back in Detective Comics issue 33 in 1939. That was when we got Batman's origin story for the very first time. In 1948, in Batman issue 47, that man who murdered the Waynes was revealed to be a guy named Joe Chill. But then, the story changed again in 1956, then another time in 1968, then again in 1969, again in 1972. 1976, another time in 1982 where he was the Joker's hitman, and that whole storyline would then be shown in the 1989 Batman movie, then again in 1984, 1985, 1986, 1987, 1989, 1998 in which Selina Kyle witnessed their murders, in 1999 in which the Wayne board was really behind it, 2001, 2003, 2006, 2008 in which Joe Chill commits suicide thanks to Batman's persuasion, 2012 in which the Penguin was suspected to be behind the hit, 2015 in which Batman encounters him through the powers he developed from the Mobius chair, and so many more adaptations that we didn't even cover. Most of the ones we did were in the comics, but there's a lot of stuff in the animated universe as well and in other movies, and in Gotham. So if that didn't make sense as to why it's scary, here is another reason why it is pretty darn frightening. All of this retconning literally threatens to change Batman's mythos every single damn time that his origin story is redone. It's frightening. DC, please stop giving us new reasons and new scenarios in which we see Batman have to relive his previous trauma and choose whether or not to kill the man who killed his parents, who may have not actually been the man who killed his parents. Ah. And at number 8, Martha Kent has a miscarriage. Moving away from the Dark Knight and onto the Man of Steel now, we've got another take on retconned origin stories. In 1986, John Byron rewrote Superman's origin story in the limited series The Man of Steel. In this limited series, the Kents take Clark in as per usual, but Byron added an extra little detail. Prior to finding little Kal-El, Martha had a miscarriage. The Kents decided to exploit that miscarriage and pretend that Clark was actually their own. Guess that's one way of getting 
getting out of, you know, neighbors asking questions. So why is this bothersome? It's the fact that the miscarriages became the motivation for why they adopted Clark rather than, you know, out of the goodness of their hearts like in the initial origin story. It felt like an extra factor that was really unnecessary. An attempt to make the Kents more broody and justified in their need of, you know, helping a baby that they found literally in the middle of nowhere. And at number 7, Re Jokers. Recently, DC came out with their black label imprint. Comics aimed at more mature readers that are meant to exist outside of the main continuity for the most part. Three Jokers is a three issue miniseries released under the black label imprint, except it was revealed by Jeff Johns that the Three Jokers is part of the main continuity, which kind of confused some people. And this might be why. That imprint was inspired by a really ridiculous plot point that pretty much just disappeared entirely from the main continuity. So once upon a time in 2016, right at the end of the New 52, before Rebirth started up, Batman found himself in the Mobius chair, a plot device that basically gave him all of the knowledge in the world. Batman learns when he sat in this chair that there's actually three Jokers out there instead of one. Then that revelation was dropped pretty much as soon as it was revealed, and hasn't been touched again since the mention of this Black Label 3 Jokers series. Oh boy. And at number 6, Damian Wayne. Back in 1987, DC released Batman Son of the Demon, in which he and Ra's al Ghul team up, and Bruce briefly considers becoming his heir. During that time though, Bruce has an affair with Ra's daughter Talia al Ghul, who ends up getting pregnant but then claims to have had a miscarriage. At the end of the story, it's revealed that she didn't have the miscarriage, and later on, Grant Morrison would introduce Damian Wayne, their son, the one who was conceived during Son of the Demon. Except, he changed some stuff. He was the product of Talia having drugged Bruce, forcibly sleeping with him in order to get pregnant as part of what she termed as a depraved eugenics experiment. So essentially she raped Batman, and Damien went from being the potential product of a heart wrenching love affair to one that Batman had no choice in, since Damien's origins have been toyed with, including a retcon that suggested he was created thanks to cloning. Moving on to number 5, Hal Jordan as Parallax. Once upon a time, during the horrible reign of the Superman story arc that was the sequel to the even more horrible death of the Superman story arc, I had to bring it up, Hal Jordan lost his shit after his home of Coast City was destroyed by Mongol and Cyborg Superman. This occurred in Green Lantern issue 46 and would become known as the Emerald Twilight story arc. A few issues later, completely distressed by Coast City being obliterated, Hal decides to use his power ring to try to recreate it, which is a big no-no for Green Lanterns. The Guardians of the Universe summon him for breaking the rule of using his ring for personal gain, which pisses Hal off even more. So he steals energy from the main power battery on the Guardians planet in order to finish recreating Coast City. The Green Lantern Corps have no choice but to stop him, but Hal ends up killing most of them, stealing each of their rings and leaving money for dead. It's then revealed in issue 50 that he's actually Parallax, the fear space insect of sorts. The literal embodiment of fear. Hal then sacrifices himself in the Final Night story arc, but then 10 years later Green Lantern gets a reboot and everything is retconned. Hal was just possessed, something that Batman would never really let him live down. Moving on to number 4, Barbara Gordon can walk. Again. Back in 2011, DC introduced the new 52. The DC universe was essentially reset with some bits of continuity remaining intact, funny enough. One of those bits of continuity that remained was Barbara Gordon's history with being paralyzed. This is something that occurred in The Killing Joke and saw the character trapped in a wheelchair, retiring from her days as Batgirl, only to rise up and reclaim her heroic identity once more by becoming Oracle. Barbara became an inspiration for physically handicapped readers everywhere, and she was still a total badass too, despite the serious trauma and continuous obstacles that her character continued to face and overcome. But then, the New 52 changed that. While the history was intact, so was Barbara's legs, or I guess technically her spine. Despite having Gail Simone pen the Batgirl series, fans were outraged with the new Batgirl volume for taking Barbara out of her chair and putting her back into the Batgirl costume. Apparently she had received some really helpful and experimental physiotherapy that allowed her to walk again. Many felt that this was harmful to a positive kind of representation that Barbara stood for in the comics previously as Oracle. The one good thing though that the series did explore was the fact that Barbara was still very haunted by her past, and her struggles with her paralysis. It wasn't something that she was just cured of and never addressed again, thankfully. But still, I mean, she's pretty badass as Oracle. Moving on to number three, a man of many races. The Flash Mantle has a history of annoying retcons over the years. One of the worst by far though is Wally West ceasing to exist. But then, two Wally Wests existing thanks to retcon messy fun time. So at the start of the new 52 and the DC Universe reboot that came with it, Wally West does not exist. Or at least the one we knew didn't exist. Another new Wally West was kicking around, but he was the biracial son of Rudy West. But then that black Wally West was retconned when DC Rebirth came around, which was yet another reboot of the DC Universe, in which the original Wally West was brought back, and this Wally West known as Wallace West was the cousin of the original Wally West and the son of the New 52 Reverse Flash, Daniel West. He was also kicking around. Confused yet? Well don't worry, DC explained the same 
same name thing as a product of the two Wallys being named after their great grandfather. But really, it was just because people were really pissed that the original Wally West had essentially disappeared. And they didn't want to get rid of the black Wally West, so they just were like, they both exist. Good job, DC. Good job. Next up at number two, Watchmen. Watchmen has long been considered one of the most important graphic novels in the history of the medium. When it came out, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons were praised by critics for transforming a medium that was often considered to be low art into something that was complex, thought provoking, and subverted what we believed comics could do. It was a game changer, and it inspired many writers and artists that followed. Watchmen has long been considered a sacred text that does not get touched. Until. DC decided that they could milk it for more money. As you can guess, Alan Moore was not fond of that. It first started with Before Watchmen, a group of limited series comics that acted as prequels leading up to the events of the main Watchmen graphic novel. Some of them were great. Darwin Cook, prior to passing away, rest in peace, did a fantastic job with the Minutemen series, expanding on the characters that Alan Moore had so finely crafted without making them into something that, you know, felt out of line. Others, weren't as well done. But their sales resulted in an unfortunate domino effect. DC brought the Watchmen into the prime continuity of their comics, making Dr. Manhattan a villain of sorts in the Doomsday Clock limited series, which acted as a direct sequel to Watchmen and tied in stories from the New 52 and Rebirth, because that's exactly what we all asked for was a sequel to Watchmen. Nobody wanted that. No one. And if you're watching this and you actually wanted that, just go read it again, seriously. Re-educate yourself. That limited series, Doomsday Clock, is still ongoing now. And apparently, by its conclusion, the DC Universe will be forever changed again. Kind of sounds like one massive retcon in the works again, doesn't it? Doesn't seem uncharacteristic of DC. The reason why it lands on our list is not the fact that it takes something that's so darn good and threatens to ruin it entirely. It's because Dr. Manhattan has been turned into a plot device to explain all of the retconning of the New 52. Dr. Manhattan is said to be the one responsible for rebooting the universe and creating the New 52 universe. Ah, essentially it is a retcon that was put in place to explain another massive retcon that a lot of people didn't really like. It also made Ozymandias regret what he had done in Watchmen and that just isn't right. That's stupid. You cannot dilute a character like that. That's not fair guys. And finally in at number one, Jason Todd is brought back. Finally we have the silliest most wretched retcon of them all. Jason Todd was brought back from the dead and Superboy Prime punched him back to life. All right. Let's really break down Jason's history here. For starters, in 1988, when Batman's comic sales were suffering thanks to the low popularity of the new Robin, Jason Todd, Dennis O'Neill of DC suggests that allowing the audience to have an interactive experience and vote on a plot point in the comics would not only be a great way to attract audiences, but also solve their little Robin problem. In a four part story arc called A Death in the Family, readers had the option to choose to call in and vote on whether or not Jason Todd would survive from an encounter with the Joker. Fans voted that he be killed off. It was a really close call with a 72 vote margin. And evidence came out afterwards that hundreds of votes for Jason's death came in from a single person who had programmed a computer to dial the voting number every 90 seconds for 8 hours. Jason was brutally beaten to death by the Joker and for a long time Jason was considered one of the only characters in comic books to never be resurrected. It's almost like a rule. One of the only ones to truly stay dead along with Bucky Barnes and Uncle Ben. But yeah, look how it panned out for all three of them, eh? Anywho, Jason was brought back to life. At first, the idea of him being resurrected was teased as part of the 2003 Hush storyline, but later in 2005, Judd Winnick brought him back into the fray with the Under the Hood story arc, with Todd having a vendetta against Batman. And it just, ugh, it just went downhill from there, guys. Music